Uh, okay. So uh, our speaker today is uh, Hannes Steele. Um, his talk is about traces on ultra powers of sister algebras. Please, Hannes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, and I will talk about joint work uh, with Ramon Antoine, Princess Pereira, and uh, Leonor Robert. And it's about uh, traces on ultra powers of sister algebras. So um, let's set up the notation first. So A, uh, throughout this talk, will be uh, some units of sister algebra. And uh, curly U is a free ultra filter on, let's say, the natural numbers. And since I'm using curly U, you already see that I'm, uh, I have been convinced by the logicians uh, to use this symbol. Uh, of course, in sister algebra, usually what we use is uh, W. But OK, I'm sticking to the notation. And if you don't exactly know what a free ultra filter is, uh, well, one way of thinking of it is an element of the stone check remainder of the natural numbers. But we'll come later a little bit more to what concretely an ultra filter is and how it's used. And if I have these two information, I can build what is called uh, a free ultra power of A along U. And what is that? Um, it's the product of A uh, indexed here over the uh, index set, which is the natural numbers. Uh, and I mod out some ideal. And this ideal is this ideal CU uh, of uh, these tuples or, or sequences, bounded sequences in A that in norm go to zero along the ultra filter. Okay, so that's uh, the construction that I can do. And uh, I will tell you in a second why, why this object is very important and why it's interesting and plays a crucial role in sister algebra theory. But let me state the, the problem that we wanna uh, look at here, namely, well, for this important object, we want to compute an important invariant, namely the, namely the treasure state space. So, uh, so these are the uh, yeah, treasure states, and they form a compact convex set. And well, I mean, compute, of course, uh, what do you mean by compute? Uh, I will make this a bit more precise uh, uh, later. But uh, one concrete way that, well, I could interpret this problem is uh, does the, the trace space of A, does it determine the trace space of the ultra power? Yeah, and maybe also the ultra filter plays a role. Um, and uh, well, that's a concrete question that uh, the answer could be yes or no. And if it's yes, well, of course, you would like to know like how, right? How is it determined? So a concrete question could be like, okay, if the trace space is very simple, uh, maybe it contains only one element uh, of the algebra. What does it tell us about the trace space of the ultra power? Or if there are no traces, you know, what happens uh, with the ultra power? Okay, so these are these are concrete questions. And well, I want to tell you why um, is one interested in knowing more about ultra powers and in particular about their traces. So where do ultra powers uh, play a role? I mean, of course. In logic and in model theory, uh, that uh, one could maybe even say that that is almost that's that's about ultra powers uh, of operator algebras and sister algebras. They study exactly questions like when are two ultra powers of two sister algebras are isomorphic. Yeah. Uh, and um, well, I cannot really go into details here or don't have the time, uh, but it definitely plays an absolutely crucial role. Uh, uh, in, in these areas. So what is a use that uh, we um, maybe have seen, even if you do not do logic or model theory, is that ultra powers are extremely useful for bookkeeping. Yeah? And of course, this somehow make it, make it sound like it's uh, not so important. But I mean, bookkeeping is actually sometimes half of the work, because uh, if you cannot do that in a, in a nice and convenient way, uh, you might not be able to prove certain theorems because while well, writing them down would just be so complicated then that you uh, well couldn't do it feasibly. So, so one example of this uh, very convenient uh, bookkeeping is uh, the following theorem of uh, Leonor Robert that I really like. And it's um, a characterization of nuclear dimension. So maybe you know,
nuclear dimension is at most n. And if you don't know how it's defined, you can use the following as the definition. Um, precisely if there are finite dimensional C star algebras, uh, many of them, F, J, K, uh, and um, CPC order zero maps. So these are completely positive contractive maps that preserve um, orthogonality of positive elements. Uh, and well, there are as many as I have the dimension or actually um, one more. So you should think of these uh, J's as colors. So we have from zero to N, N plus one colors. And they go from here. So A is the, the starting algebra. You go uh, into this thing here, which is not precisely an ultra power now, but it's ultra product because um, uh, an ultra power like here is when I use the same algebra over and over and an ultra product is if I use different algebras. Okay, so it's a straightforward generalization. Uh, so I have here something which is fairly concrete and easy to understand. It's an ultra uh, product of finite dimensional C star algebras. That's a C star algebra that we think we understand more or less completely. You have a map from A to here, a CPC order zero map, and you have a map from here back. And you have n plus one maps, and they uh, sum up, if you compose them, to this iota. And this iota is the inclusion, the canonical inclusion of the algebra A in its ultra power. And what is this inclusion? Just take an element uh, and then just uh, map it to the product, taking the same element over and over, and then look at it in the quotient uh, by this ideal uh, CU. OK, so, so this is very, uh, very nice. Yeah, so I, I can exactly factor the inclusion of A into its ultra power, not just up to epsilon or something, but I exactly factor it. And uh, well, Lionel used this then to prove some uh, nice other theorems with this. So, sorry, uh, may I? Yeah, what, sure. What's the role of the subindex K in FJK? Oh yeah, sorry, this is the uh, where the ultra filter lives. Um, so that's so the j is uh, runs from zero to n, and the k is um, the natural numbers. Yeah, um, um, where the the ultra filter is on uh, some index set. Um, okay, but uh, okay, so but the f j k are indexed. I mean, it's not the same. I mean, when in the definition of the ultra filter, the algebra is always a. In all the, I mean, you you take a, an infinite of copies of the same a and then divide. But here you are, you mean you take uh, the product over k. So the f mm -hmm. j, j, the f j k are infinitely many different algebras. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, that's true. On the previous slide, I gave you the definition of the uh, ultra product. So let me uh, go back and um, so in this definition here. If if the a's uh, were not always the same, but uh, like say we had a n here, yeah. Uh, well, then you can do the same. It's the same definition. You have okay. a n in the product of a n's with the same condition here that the norm goes to zero. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. Um, okay. And then, so we have the bookkeeping. Um, and then, well, I want to say a word at least about the central sequence algebra, which um, is an important gadget. Uh, it's constructed as follows. You take the ultra power, and then uh, you look at the elements in the ultra power that commute with the copy of A. So one usually writes it like this, A prime. So this prime from phenomenal algebras, we use this notation for all the elements that commute uh, with something. And uh, here, the A, I mean here really the, the copy of A in here that I get from this, this map uh, I, iota. And this central sequence algebra, so these um, are super important uh, objects um, that encode a lot of structure about um, the C star algebra. Oops. And for instance, uh, Kirchberg uh, in the 90s uh, proved an important uh, theorem, the O infinity absorption theorem. Let me just very quickly somehow outline his proof, which is, of course, a very deep proof. So if you have a separable, simple, nuclear, purely infinite C star algebra, he showed that such algebras are uh, O infinity stable. They absorb tensorially 
the Kunst algebra O infinity. Well, what's the strategy of the proof? So this is actually the, the main uh, difficulty here. Uh, proof that this implies that the central sequence algebra is uh, properly infinite. Um, well, if you know that, uh, you deduce from that that uh, O infinity embeds into the central sequence algebra. So that's relatively easy to see. That's the true that that is true in properly infinite system algebras in general. And then if you know that um, O infinity embeds into the central sequence algebra, you get this tensorial uh, absorption. Um, and well, in in Kirchberg's theorem, the central sequence algebra definitely plays a crucial role. Okay. So um, yeah. So ultra powers play an important uh, role in classification and structure theory of C-star algebras, and we want to know more about them. Uh, and knowing what their traces are uh, is important, for instance, also because they play a role in the, in the well, solution of the Elliott uh, classification uh, program recently or five years ago uh, that goes also through ultra power techniques. So, Here's the problem again, compute the tracial state space of the ultra power. And uh, first thing that we note is that uh, there is a natural map from, well, something that I will explain um, to the tracial state space of what we're interested in. So this uh, ultra power, I can think of it as, well, the ultra product of the same algebra over this ultra filter. Uh, and here on the left, well, Okay, I will explain to you what that is, but uh, notice that here, this is something that's definitely constructed out of the trace uh, space of A and, um, well, the ultra filter. So the, so the thing here on the left, that is definitely something that is determined by T of A and U. Yeah? And so if this natural map is an isomorphism, then I can say that at least I know uh, that there is a way of computing the treasure spa state space of the ultra power by that of A. So now let me explain to you a little bit what this natural map is. And for this, uh, we will use a different viewpoint on what ultra filters are. I told you before, you could maybe think of them as elements of the stone check remainder. Now let's take a different viewpoint. Let's think of them as families of subsets. Um, of the natural numbers. And it's, uh, well, not just any family, it's a family with the property that if I take any two members, then the intersection is also there. And then of course, that's not all, that's not all for the definition of an ultra filter. Um, it, an ultra filter also has the property that if any set is in there and any larger set is also in U and it should be maximal with that property that makes it an ultra filter. And what makes it free is that it's not just the uh, family of sets that contain a particular element of the natural numbers. Okay, so th there's a lot of things that I just said, but what will be important for us now is that it's stable under intersections. That property now uh, tells us that I can think of the ultra filter as a directed set, and I will use it as the index set uh, for some net, and I will build a inductive limit. Um, as follows. So uh, the, the elements in the inductive system that I want to look at are products of A where the index set is elements of the, of the filter. And if I have two elements E and F in the filter and one is contained in the other, so E is smaller than F, then there's a natural map from the product indexed over F to the product indexed over E. And that map is just uh, well, forgetting, so it's a quotient map. I mean, uh, taking an, a tuple of index elements indexed by F, uh, just forget the elements that come from the index not in E and just, uh, well, take the same tuple um, restricted to the smaller index set. Uh, so this is a quotient map here. And um, well, then there is a categorical construction of uh, an ultra power um, and namely, it's it's the limit of these um, products 
indexed over the elements of the filter and viewing the filter as a directed set. Okay, so um, this, um, it, I think it's a very useful uh, construction of the ultra power, which is not the, the same as I said before with this uh, product by some ideal, but it's not difficult to show that they are uh, isomorphic. Um, and well, using this viewpoint has the advantage that well, we can use the, the power of, of category theory, um, which will give us eventually this map and it will give us such, not just some map, but a natural map with this, uh, that imagine natural map phi here. And it also tells us uh, what the left-hand side should be. Um, namely, the left-hand side is what is called an ultra co-product. So I just have to turn everything around um, and I use the categorical definition. They, of course, there is a, another one as well, but let's use this one now. And then the ultra co-product of a compact convex uh, space, here I take the trace space, is now it's an inverse limit, yeah, because everything turns around, uh, again, over the same um, net, U. And then it's the inverse limit of co-products, not of products. Uh, and, th and then here, this is the co-product in the category of um, compact convex spaces. So one has to be a little bit careful what that is. So I mean the categorical uh, co-product. So what it would do essentially on the um, extreme points, there would be a disjoint union, but it's, it's not a disjoint union of uh, compact convex sets. So it's, um, yeah, well, it's the it's the co-product in the right category. Um, all right, that's what it is. Now, what is this natural map now? So it's it goes from well, uh, an inverse limit of co-products to traces on a direct limit of products, and it uh, essentially comes out of category theory. So this this large diagram should somehow convince you of that. So uh, let's look at this. So here I have up here in the first line I have the inductive system, which constructs me um, the ultra power. So the, the elements in the limit are, well, the products um, of A indexed over some subset or some element of uh, the ultra filter that goes to this limit, which is, as we just saw this. Now I apply the trace functor. So I apply traces everywhere. So put traces here, put traces here. Now arrows turn around, right? Because um, yeah, if I have a, a trace here, it will give me a trace here. Um, so, so all these arrows here to the right, they turn into arrows to the left. Uh, and then I can also, well, um, here the last line, uh, instead of trace of the product, I look at uh, co-product of the trace of A. And there's a natural map here. And then I construct the inverse limit. So I have maps here. And then just by the universal property uh, of inverse limits, there will be this map here, phi. Um, so that's why it really is a natural map. And it goes uh, from this to this. And the idea is, of course, that this thing here is easy to compute. And this thing here is difficult to compute. Um, and here's the first um, proposition, observation, and this natural map is always injective. So that's good news. Yeah, at least uh, it's not just some crazy map. It's a it's a nice map. It's uh, well, it you could think it embeds the the computable traces, the ones that we understand, into the traces that we're interested in. So then um, the question that uh, naturally arises now is is this map subjective? Yeah, and uh, well, if it's not, or maybe related to this question of subjectivity is, what is the image? Yeah, um, and uh, to answer this question, uh, we'll have to recall the following definition of a, a limit trace. Um, so this construction goes as follows. If you have a sequence of traces on A, um, for every natural number, I can look at the quotient map from the product of A to A. 
which is projection onto the nth coordinate. And I compose this with, with my given trace t tau n. And then I get a new uh, trace tau n bar, let's call it. And uh, the nice thing is that now these traces all live on the same space, uh, namely on, on the product of A. <clears throat> yeah, so, so given a, a sequence of traces on A, I get a sequence of traces on the product of A. And now something that's really, really nice with ultra powers is that I can always take limits uh, along them in every compact uh, house of space. So the, the trace space of any a trace of space, state space of any unit of sister algebra is a, a nice compact house of space. Um, and there I can take the limit along the ultra filter and it exists and it, it's some element of that thing. So it's a, it's a trace on this product. And then you can check that it actually vanishes on this ideal that we had to mod out uh, to get the ultra power. And therefore it induces a, what is called limit trace uh, on the ultra power. Okay, so that's a, that's a standard construction. And uh, well, this notation is not so standard, but we had to come up with some notation. We call these, well, lim t, so the limit traces on a u. Uh, so this is, uh, well, the, the traces that I get in this way, but from this construction, and it would be a certain subset uh, of the traces state space. Um, and th this, these ones, these limit traces, they have been uh, considered before and studied before. And now the next proposition uh, answers in some sense, one of the questions before, namely it characterizes exactly what the image of phi is, namely uh, the image of this natural map from, from this thing here that we think we understand to uh, this thing here that we wanna understand. The image of this map is precisely the closure of the set of limit traces and closure in the natural topology. Uh, and that would be the weak star topology here. Um, if you think of it as a dual of, of a ceased algebra. Uh, okay, well, so that, yeah, answers the question about the image. And well, it, uh, then the question about the surjectivity of the map phi turns into a question about density of limit traces. Yeah? All right, because the, the image of phi is the closure of this, meaning that phi is surjective, precisely if the limit traces are dense. And this question here, this has actually been studied before. Actually, not with the motivation that we had, um, but so of course some of the connections are there. And, and this question in this form has been looked at and partial solutions have been obtained. And I think the first one uh, was by Ozawa in <clears throat> 2013. Uh, and so the, the the answers, the partial answers to these questions are always positive. So they're always yes, if something under some regularity assumption. So here, for instance, yes, the limit traces are dense if um, A is exact and C stable. And then this was generalized um, by Ng and Robert, 2016. Also, yes, if A has strict comparison by traces, which uh, in incorporates the, the result of Ozawa. And then this was uh, even more generalized uh, by Archibald, Robert, and Tiguizis uh, to um, a finite radius of comparison. Um, okay, so just to illustrate you what, uh, what this gives us as an example, if you know that your algebra has a unique trace, uh, well then, If there's one trace, um, then there's only one sequence of traces, and then there's only one limit trace, and it's we call it uh, TU. Okay, it tells me that my internet connection is unstable, but I hope you can still hear me fine. Yep. Yep. Okay. Good. Um, good. So uh, if, if then I am in the setting of these uh, partial solutions, so let's for simplicity say exact and z-stable, uh, then the traces on the ultra power 
are uh, nothing but the limit traces and it's just a unique uh, trace. So, um, so let's take any exact C stable C star trace. Uh, so like the Jiangsu algebra itself, for instance, or UHF algebra. Um, but it doesn't actually have to be simple for this result. So, so this simplicity is not uh, an assumption here. Um, then the, we know that the auto power will also have uh, a unique tracial state. Yeah? And so that's a, an answer, right? I mean, then we know um, exactly what the trace space is. But now we want to, of course, go on and see uh, how far can we push, in particular, these uh, partial results that you can see here, like in increasing generality. And then the question would be, well, does it end? Like, is there a, um, you know, is there a limit where you cannot be go beyond, or is it maybe always dense uh, the limit traces? And then, well, we have a, a satisfying answer, I think, and that's the main uh, result. Uh, of of this collaboration uh, is this uh, theorem which characterizes precisely when well the map phi is an isomorphism and that of course uh, that I explained already which is precisely the same thing as to say that the limit traces are dense uh, so the theorem says that following things are equivalent one and two that's now we understand that uh, but the interesting part now is third condition. Um, which is, well, it's some condition about uh, commutators. And it, it's the condition that um, if you have an element A, which is in the closed linear span of the commutators. So A, A here, I mean elements that of the form A times B minus B times A. So this is uh, also in incidentally exactly the elements that vanish under all tracial states. Um, so if you have such an element A, there should exist uh, elements B, J, and C, J, so that I can approximate A by such a finite sum of commutators. Um, and of course, that is kind of obvious from being in the span closure, so in the closed linear span. Uh, the, the problem is only that I should be able to do this with a fixed number n independent of my element A. So the, the crucial thing here is the order of quantifiers. Yeah? So there exists one N that works for all elements A. If I would turn this around, that would be a statement that's obviously true. Um, so, so this number N independent of the element, if I can find that, that means precisely that the limit traces are dense. Um, okay, so, so that's interesting because uh, as we will see in a, in a minute, uh, they are sister algebras, and they had been studied before, where um, the third condition here fails. Uh, so there are sister algebras, um, in some sense, variations of Villets and algebras, uh, where this commutator approximation, um, well, cannot be done with a bounded number of commutators. Um, okay, and then there's a second part to this theorem. So I let me just. I'm repeating here, uh, the first one is this isomorphism of the natural map phi. The second condition is here, this uh, thing about commutators. And I have to throw in here also a um, slightly technical assumption that the quasi traces are the same as the traces. So if you're unhappy about this, just assume exactness or nuclearity. Um, and then we can uh, show that these conditions are also equivalent to a condition about Kunzumi group. And the Kunzumi group uh, is some uh, partially ordered semigroup generalizing the Murray von Neumann semigroup and constructed in the same way as the Murray von Neumann semigroup. But instead of uh, projections, you use positive elements. And it's, um, well, it's equivalent to a comparison property, um, which is the following. So if you have any epsilon, and every uh, and any uh, d natural number d, there should exist a number n such that the following holds. If you have two elements x and y in your consumer group, that uh, so hat here means um, compare tracially. So tracially, this element is slightly below 
uh, so tracially x is slightly below y, then that should imply that x is less than y after an amplification, so after I multiply by some number. Um, okay, and this should hold for well all a and uh, all x and y in the consumer group that are somehow controlled in their size. So you can think of this thing here that x and y come from positive matrices in d by d matrices uh, over a, and and y should be not too small. So that's some kind of fullness condition. But okay, um, and fourth condition is a much stronger comparison property than the third one. Namely, um, there should exist a number m now. That's that's like an invariant almost of the C star algebra. So this number m here is independent of everything that comes after it, such that for every d, which is kind of the matrix size, exists a number n, which will be the amplification, such that if two elements compare tracially, then they compare after an amplification by n, and I have to enlarge the, the y also by multiplying by this number m. We'll say, see later that, um, well, what possible values for m are, and it should hold for all elements x and y in the constant group, the same conditions as before. Um, so now here's the example of uh, Robert, which was done a while back uh, when he was studying uh, commutators. Uh, namely, he was showing he showed that there is a simple nuclear sister algebra with a unique trace, um, where uh, well this commutator approximation is um, doesn't work. So for every m, there is a contractive element in. Oh, here I mean the the span closure of uh, commutators um, that well cannot be approximated by by m elements, by, by sum of m commutators. So the distance of this element to the set of sums of at most m many commutators is one. Yeah? And then uh, uh, since this holds for every m, there cannot be such a, a uniform number n as in the, in, in the condition uh, of the theorem. So, so this example is one where, where the theorem doesn't uh, hold. So, so it means while the algebra has a unique trace and therefore there's only one limit trace. Uh, and so the limit traces are even also closed. Uh, yeah. But the second condition in the theorem is not satisfied. So um, the, the trace space of the ultra power is not just this one trace, it's, it's bigger. Uh, and uh, so this is of course a, uh, a situation that's somehow unsatisfying. Yeah? It, it means that, um, well, we have, we have a single trace, a unique trace on my algebra. And suddenly in the ultra power, besides the, the canonical limit trace that I can construct from this unique trace, there are other traces appearing, yeah? uh, surprising ones. Um, and, and we don't know what they are. I mean, so we, we know it, it is at least at least one more, I guess that's that's what we can say. But of course, uh, well, I haven't thought about it much. I mean, surely there's there's actually uh, infinitely many more. So it's it's we don't know exactly what trace simplex here is uh, of this uh, of this algebra of of uh, Robert, but it's probably uh, very very big, and for sure it's uh, not just one. And the map phi, the natural map phi, is not an isomorphism. Uh, I also want to mention here. Um, a earlier result actually of uh, Tristan Weiss and Elias Farah, because they were studying uh, a question that uh, also comes up somehow naturally in this context, namely, uh, well, I was asking about density, dens density of limit traces, um, and they were asking about equality. So uh, a stronger, stronger thing. And they were showing that uh, if A has infinitely many extremal traces, then for sure, not every trace on the ultra power is a limit trace. Yeah. Um, so, of course, then it could still be true that the limit traces are dense, yeah? um, but they're not going to be everything. So that's that's definitely the related uh, theorem uh, that I also wanted to to mention here. Okay. Now, uh, the last uh, fifteen minutes or so, 
uh, I want to connect uh, these results that we have uh, to some something that uh, Wilhelm Winter did for well classification and structure of uh, simple sister algebras, and that's this notion of uh, uh, pureness that connects to z stability. And this um, for this I have to first define I guess what uh, pureness means. And so this has to do with um, with certain comparison and divisibility properties in the consumer group. So I want to mention, I want to define here uh, what the comparison property is that one uh, considers. And we say a C-star algebra has uh, M comparison. Uh, if I take um, one element and M plus one other elements and a small epsilon, and if tracially X is a little bit below all of these elements yj, then x should be dominated by the sum of these n plus one elements. Okay, so you might have seen maybe um, strict comparison, which is uh, a condition that uh, plays an important role. Um, and then that is nothing but zero comparison. Um, and so if I have only one element here. It means that if, if x tracially is a little bit below y, then x should be below y. Uh, so that's that's what's called strict comparison, some, sometimes also called almost unperforation. So it's it's an important property. It has different names. Um, all right. So here's a theorem that uh, we can uh, prove with our uh, results. Namely, if A has finite nuclear dimension and doesn't have to be simple, yeah, uh, then the map phi is an isomorphism. So then we know uh, exactly what all the traces on the ultra power are. Let me explain to you what the how the proof goes, the sketch. So um, the result that I mentioned earlier about uh, bookkeeping and how I can somehow use it to give a nice definition of nuclear dimension of Leonard Robert. Well, actually that is used it to define or to prove the following. If you have nuclear dimension at most m, then you see the algebra has m comparison. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's very nice. Um, and then we will verify this uh, fourth condition from the theorem. Uh, and we just recall here what it is. It, it said it should be one number m such that for each matrix size D, the existing amplification n such that if x and y compare tracially uh, up to amplification, uh, x is dominated by m times y. Okay, and now let's see that we can actually verify this condition with, with the following. Um, uh, right, we use n equals to one, so we, we don't actually have to uh, amplify, and we use m, so this, this global constant, it's two times m plus one. So it's uh, somehow the bigger, the bigger the nuclear dimension is, but it's, it's always something finite. And now, uh, y. So if I start with x and y that compare tracially, then well, I always have this this little epsilon here, so I I just use uh, one half, and uh, uh, and if I want to do this epsilon here, take one half, then I should make the uh, the y larger. But it's it's just I mean this is just a, a simple thing here. So I instead of y, I take two times y, and then I have my epsilon here. Okay. Now I can apply M comparison. And I, so I'm having, I'm in this form that X tracially is below, slightly below two times Y. And I just use at Y M plus one times here. So um, what I just get immediately from this is that X is less than M plus one times this element to Y. Uh, so, so I've verified this, this here with N equals one capital M uh, two times M plus one. Uh, so, so here you see in a very nice way how um, somehow Kunstmi group techniques uh, can prove you something about, well, tracial stage spaces, for instance, and um, yeah, give you some, some nice results. Um, so that was comparison. Oh yeah. Um, well, as a corollary, I guess, yeah, if A is finite nuclear dimension, then the trace space of the ultra power is the ultra core product of the trace space of A. 
Um, now let's turn to divisibility. Um, if, or we say that A is indivisible, uh, if now, that's also a, a mouthful, but I will uh, explain it. So if you have two elements, X prime and X in the consumer group, that in this, uh, what is called uh, way below or a compact containment relation, uh, X prime is somehow below X. And I have a number K by, what, by which I want to divide. There should be a new element, Y, that, well, it sits below X K, K times. K times Y is below X. And, and X prime, which is like an approximation to X, um, sits below K plus one times Y, but I also have to add an extra error of, of M. Oh, and that should have been N here, sorry. So it's N divisibility, and then this should be N here. And uh, what you might have seen is what is called almost divisible, and that is nothing but zero divisible. And essentially what it means is that mm, every element in the consumer group can be almost divided by K. So if I have X and I have K, I find a, a Y such that K times Y is below X and K plus one times Y is above X. So you can see here in this relation yeah, that, well, the element Y, it really wants to be something like one over K X. But you know, in the consumer group or also in, in K theory, right? You know this that you might not be able to exactly divide by something, but but only almost. Uh, and then that that's often good enough. We call it almost divisibility. And then if you uh, cannot do this, but even with a bigger error here, then when we call it uh, n divisibility. And then um, the combination of these two things. That's an important definition of winter. We say a C star algebra is MN pure if it has M comparison and N divisibility. And so both, it, it has some comparison and some divisibility. And if it has the, both, the, the best of both, uh, we say it's pure. Uh, so A is pure if it's uh, zero, zero pure, which zero, zero are the best of these uh, uh, comparison and divisibility properties. So, so pure C star algebras, these, these are the ones with the best comparison and best visibility. And um, Winter in 2012 proved his uh, famous theorem that if A is simple, separable, locally finite nuclear dimension, uh, and M and pure for some numbers M and N, then the algebra is Z-stable. Uh, a locally finite nuclear dimension means uh, approximated by sub sister algebras that have a nu finite nuclear dimension. Important class of algebras where this is automatic is the uh, inductive limit of sub homogeneous algebras, for instance. Um, and there, this is automatic. And then um, uh, it's also automatic, of course, if the sister algebra has finite nuclear dimension. And then, kind of as a corollary of this theorem, uh, you get what maybe you know better as Winter's theorem, namely that if you're simple, separable, and have finite nuclear dimension, then you're z-stable. Finite nuclear dimension almost immediately gives you mn pure. That's also one thing that he does in the paper. Um, I already mentioned that Leonor Robert shows that finite nuclear dimension implies uh, m comparison for some m. And then you also need the visibility, and you can, you can show it. Um, but notice that z stability uh, implies pureness. And that's actually an earlier result of Mikhail Rodham. Um, if A is z-stable, then A is pure. OK. So if I um, combine these two, so I, I just uh, wrote them here again, um, Winter's theorem and uh, Rodham's theorem, what I get is that if I have a simple, separable, locally finite nuclear dimension C star algebra, then M and pure implies pure. Yeah? So if I, under these assumptions, if you have just some comparison and some divisibility, you have the best comparison and best divisibility. And we, um, yeah, we generalize this uh, 
by removing um, all the assumptions here, uh, well, except simplicity. So we remove, as in particular, the locally finite nuclear dimension assumption. So we show that just if A is simple, then M and pure implies pure. And, and this is really a, a theorem now that applies to non-nuclear and non-exact uh, ceased algebras as well. So, and how I would uh, interpret what this is saying is that, well, as, as soon as you have a little bit of comparison and a little bit of divisibility, then you have best comparison and best divisibility. Or put differently, if you have a simple C star algebra that's not pure, then it has to either uh, fail in its comparison properties drastically, like it has to really has to have really, really bad comparison properties, or it has to be, it has to have very, very bad divisibility properties. Uh, so uh, for an algebra not to be pure, and so for instance, not to be Z-stable or something like this, uh, you have to fail in at least one direction, comparison or divisibility. Uh, and this is one way of, of interpreting uh, what this um, theorem here is saying. And um, so the, the, the proof, yeah, uh, it, it uses the techniques and the uh, ultra power uh, techniques that I, I showed you uh, earlier. And it, I think it's very curious that um, somehow you, you have here a, a statement that really on the nose has nothing to do with traces but it actually goes through the technique of uh, looking at traces on, on ultra powers. And then it uh, gives you this, um, well, improvement of the, of the combination of the result of winter and the result of Rada. Um, okay, and that is all. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Hannes, for that very nice talk. Uh, do we have any questions from the participants? I have a very stupid question. Um, namely, um, I mean, uh, the U, the, 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 the ultra filter. The ultra filter. Uh, it's not important. Ah, that's that's a very good uh, question. Because um, I mean, yeah. it's always one, but you you don't want you never said that you needed this for every ultra filter, just to one. Yeah. Well, it's actually a, a consequence of the res of our results that I mean, if if the map phi. Um, is an isomorphism for one ultra filter, then it's an isomorphism for all ultra filters. So, so we, we, what we get is that um, somehow, you know, either it, it, the result does not depend on the ultra filter. So, all the ultra filters are equal uh, for this result, at least. Um, although we're not, of course, we don't, in general, it's not true that all ultra powers are isomorphic. Yeah? So, I think, I mean, that's something that logicians uh, study for sure, uh, whether the ultra power depend on the ultra filter and, the, and it may or may not, I mean, depending on what kind of set theory axioms you assume. Um, a different question would be, does the trace space of the ultra power depend on the ultra filter? And what we show here is that, well, under regularity assumptions, uh, no, it's always the same. Um, of course, if you don't satisfy these regularity assumptions, so for instance, uh, Robert's result, uh, then this one here. So I guess here we, we can't answer it. Potentially for this example, uh, the trace space of AU, it's wild and it could depend on U. Um, okay, my suspicion is that it, it still doesn't depend on you, but um, this we can prove at the moment. Yeah. Uh, what about, for example, in Kirchberg's theorem that you mentioned? Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Did he prove this for every U, use it for, yeah. every, for some U? 
for uh, for every it's in the, this is independent of you. Yeah. So this embedding of um, or infinity. Yeah, of or infinity. This is really uh, what's it? Yeah. And uh, no, this is here for every u. Yeah. Yeah, but you just need it for one u. To these. You need it for, but it's. I guess it also comes out of the of the theorem. It's like um, you need it only for one. That's true. But if you have it for one, you have it for all. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's essentially. I think it's. You know, if that's exactly the question, what what people do in model theory, uh, everything that you can that's axiomatizable in what, whatever that means now. <laughs> uh, every property that's axiomatizable, that will not depend on the auto filter, I think. Uh, I, well, I don't know if there's any logician in the audience that uh, will say that I'm not saying that correctly, but I think this is maybe roughly what, uh, what they're trying or what, 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 what they're doing. Um, but then, of course, there are uh, properties of CC algebra that are not axiomatizable. So then uh, it might still be true that um, two different ultra powers are not isomorphic, although they have all the same properties uh, mm -hmm. that are axiomatizable. Yes. So, for instance, with real rank zero would be something like still rank one. So, like if, if one ultra power has real rank zero, I think then all of them have. So, you know, th these are the kind of statements that they, I, I think, can prove with model theory. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any further questions? In the chat. I have a comment. This is David Sherman. Hi, Hannes. Ah, uh, hi. Hi. Um, just that. Really, the first kinds of results like what you're doing go back to the people in Banach spaces at the end of the 70s and 1980s, um, because they knew that C of K Banach spaces um, are an axiomatizable class. So if you take an ultra product of C of Ks, then you get some C of K. And so they were trying to figure out what is the K. Um, and actually, your theorem, not, not the algebraic part, but the first parts of your theorem, I think, are were proved in the abelian case in before 1980. Um, and so it just for a st historical perspective, I guess, you know, how do you how do you take a bunch of K alphas and then um, and then compute what the spectrum of C of K, the ultra product of C of K alpha is. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have to do some kind of topological ultra product or uh, co product and that that's that's just yeah. the, the abelian case, which isn't really what you're interested in. But the fact that it, this uh, topological ultra product is dense in the spectrum of the ultra mm -hmm. product right. was was done long, long time ago by in, in the Bonnach space case. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And uh, of course, I also should have mentioned that uh, ultra power techniques are absolutely fundamental in Bonnach space theory, and that's. Uh, also, where they maybe were developed first, before they were uh, developed in, in C star algebras and operator algebras, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now that Banach, as opposed to C star algebras, I mentioned, uh, when when you wrote, when you showed this slide that we're looking at now, I remembered, um, I saw years ago, I was interested in operator ideas. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, people like uh, Dikema, Oshisky, Figiel had uh, results of the sort uh, in this operator idea or in this algebra, uh, every commutator, I mean, everything in the linear span mm -hmm. is exact, can be written as a sum of three commutators or 24 or I mean, I don't know if if such results uh, make sense or amount in sister isomers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you see, there, there is a number here, uh, uh, and uh, knowing what this number is uh, is interesting. Yeah, 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 but there is approximation, <laughs> right? 
Okay, that's 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 true. But you, so here it's approximation. You, it's sometimes I mean, it's you know that the, the the span of the commutators, yeah. everything in the span of the commutators is a sum of the fixed numbers of commutators. So it's even better, yeah. So and that's true. I think uh, people have studied this a, a lot, like for B of H, uh, what it yeah. is mm -hmm. uh, for uh, for for Norman algebras. You know, I think it's. I mean, they're good bounds, right? As you say, like some numbers, like sixteen or five or something. And I and and Leonor Robert also has studied this. Um, and I think for for Z stable C star algebras, if I'm not mistaken, I think seven is the number that they can do. So like here, this and this is for for this version. So I think uh, they can do with seven. Of course, probably that's still not the best, right? I mean, so it, uh, at the end, it's probably one, two, or three, or uh, something very, very low. But to to get uh, lower bounds for this this is very difficult so it's so you know you know you can you can show uh, examples like this one here where well it's infinity somehow you cannot do it or you get some upper bound which i don't know seems to be around 10 or something like this and then the optimal result is probably getting it down to two uh you know like every everything in the For instance, uh, so there they proved this, uh, and the star algebras were much behind in that uh, that regard. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any more questions or comments? If there aren't, I will stop the recording now. <laughs>